This is Andy Osbaugh from Duke University School of Medicine. Fungal infections can range from nuisance superficial skin conditions to life-threatening invasive infections, and they often require antifungal therapy to eradicate. During this discussion, we will focus on agents that are used primarily for systemic and invasive fungal infections, as opposed to superficial skin and mucosal infections. The learning objectives for this talk, therefore, are to first explore how the major antifungal drug classes work by defining their mechanism of action. Now, secondly, there's an interesting issue in considering antifungal therapy since fungi and humans are both eukaryotes and therefore have very similar cell physiology. It is therefore quite difficult to identify cellular features that are sufficiently unique in fungi to serve as targets for antifungal therapy. This is in contrast to prokaryotic bacteria that possess many cellular processes and structures not present in mammalian cells. Therefore, our second objective will be to link the antifungal mechanism of action with any toxicities experienced commonly by the patients treated with these medications. And lastly, we will define specific infections that are commonly treated by each major antifungal drug. There are only four major classes of antifungal agents used for invasive fungal infections, and they target three basic cellular processes. As we look at the fungal cell, these processes are number one, interfering with the production or function of ergosterol, one of the main lipids in the fungal cell membrane, two, inhibiting the production of components of the fungal cell wall, such as beta-glucan, and three, disrupting fungal nucleic acid synthesis. So let's first consider ergosterol inhibitors. Ergosterol is the fungal equivalent of the cholesterol that composes a large amount of mammalian cell membranes, and demonstrated on this slide is the similar structure of these two molecules. One of the first major systemic antifungals discovered was amphotericin B. Amphotericin B binds and disrupts one of the principal components of fungal cell membranes, this lipid-like molecule called ergosterol. Since we do not have ergosterol in our cells, amphotericin B has some degree of specificity to bind and harm fungal cell surfaces. However, likely due to cross-reactivity with mammalian membrane lipids, amphotericin B does display toxicity to the human host. Demonstrated here are diagrams representing the actual pores that are uh, predicted to form by amphotericin B in the fungal cell membrane, disrupting the structure and causing fungal cell death. Now, amphotericin B is given intravenously or parenterally, since it is not well absorbed when administered orally. It can be associated with immediate infusion-related side effects, such as fever and flushing. But most of these side effects can be prevented with prior administration of medications, such as Tylenol, acetaminophen, and antihistamines. Amphotericin B can also cause more serious side effects, such as renal failure and electrolyte disturbances. It can also result in ear problems, such as altered vestibular function, tinnitus or ringing in the ears, and hearing loss. In order to minimize the toxicity of this medication, amphotericin B has been physically packaged in association with various lipids. The goal of lipid-associated or, or liposomal preparations is to create a delivery vessel that will directly fuse with cell membrane and deliver the drug intracellularly. Various lipid-associated forms of amphotericin B are available, and they do in fact have less renal toxicity than the parent compound. Despite its toxicity, amphotericin B is still used widely today. Its broad antifungal activity makes it acceptable therapy for many life-threatening fungal infections. It is absolutely indicated for the treatment induction phase of meningitis due to Cryptococcus neoformans, as well as for infections due to invasive molds, especially mucormycosis. The mucoralis molds are only susceptible to very high doses of amphotericin B products and generally not to other antifungal compounds. Endemic fungi, such as histoplasma, blastomyces, and coccidioides, uh, are also often treated with amphotericin B products. Additionally, there are some fungi which on susceptibility testing are only susceptible to agents such as amphotericin and resistant to other antifungal agents. And these will also be uh, treated by this agent. 
Again, some of the names of the available forms of amphotericin B include uh, amphotericin B deoxycholate or standard amphotericin, and lipid-associated amphotericin products such as liposomal amphotericin B or ambosome, or amphotericin B lipid cl complex known as ABLSET. The azole antifungal agents are the most commonly used drugs to treat systemic fungal infections. Like amphotericin B, these medications interfere with ergosterol. However, they act to inhibit the ERG11 protein required for the biosynthesis of this important fungal membrane lipid. Since mammals do not have an ERG11 protein and do not make ergosterol, these drugs in general have limited side effects to the patients. Now, two important side effects to remember about systemic azoles have nothing to do with their antifungal mechanism of action, but they are still very clinically important. These medications can cause serious liver toxicity, and liver enzymes must be followed closely during their use. Also, azoles can cause prolonged repolarization of cardiac electrical conduction, manifested as a prolonged QT interval on an electrocardiogram. Any agent that lengthens the QT interval can result in serious arrhythmias. Therefore, cardiac conduction delays must be followed closely. One additional consideration with using azoles is that these medicines can inhibit cytochrome P450. Now, this is not a, just a side effect of this medic medication, but you must remember this when using azoles uh, to consider potential drug-drug interactions. The azoles can be subdivided into those agents which have activity primarily against yeasts and those with expanded activity against molds. The most important yeast active azole is fluconazole. This medication is available in both IV and oral forms and it has excellent oral, oral bioavailability. Therefore, whenever possible, it should be administered oral, orally to minimize cost and treatment complex, complexity. Now, now, fluconazole is often used to treat infections due to susceptible candida species, especially candida albicans. There are some candida species, such as candida cruzii, that are intrinsically resistant to fluconazole. Additionally, species such as candida glabrata can display dose-dependent susceptibility to this drug, requiring very high doses for curative therapy. Therefore, it is often important to ensure that yeast species causing systemic fungal infections are identified to a species level. Also, antifungal susceptibility testing for important clinical isolates can also help you to direct which agents will likely be best to treat these serious infections. In addition to the candida yeast infections, fluconazole is also used to treat Cryptococcus neoformans infections. Now, as I mentioned previously, amphotericin B and flucytosine, and flucytosine are used for the initial treatment phases of cryptococcal meningitis. However, fluconazole is used often in the maintenance and preventive stages of treatment or for treatment of non-CNS cryptococcosis, such as pulmonary infections. More recently, Several azole compounds have been developed that have activity against invasive mold infections. These include itraconazole, voriconazole, and posiconazole. Itraconazole is limited by comparatively poor oral bioavailability, so most serious mold infections are now treated with one of the other two agents. However, voriconazole has been demonstrated in clinical trials to be the most effective uh, medication for the treatment of pulmonary aspergillosis. Also, posiconazole is very effective in the prevention of serious fungal infections after chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. Both come in IV and oral formulations. Due to the life-threatening nature of many mold infections, clinicians will often want to document that these medications are being absorbed when given orally, and they do this by following serum drug levels. Posiconazole and voriconazole also have activity against most of the yeasts that, flu that fluconazole treats as well. Now, these azoles are also indicated for the treatment of infections due to the endemic fungi, again, such as histoplasmosis, coccidioidomycosis, and blastomycosis. One of the newest classes of antifungal agents targets the fungal-specific cell wall. This structure is composed primarily of complex carbohydrates, such as chitin and glucans. 
Now, the echinocandins inhibit the enzyme that makes beta-1,3-glucan, one of the most abundant cell wall carbohydrates. Again, since we do not have this enzyme, nor do we make beta-glucans, the echinocandins have minimal toxicity. Available echinocandins include caspofungin, mycofungin, and anigilofungin. These medications are only available in IV formulations, although oral echinocandins are currently in development. How are these agents used? The echinocandins are primarily indicated for serious infections due to many candida species. They are often the first-line agents for candidemia or candida bloodstream infection, being, an effectively against, being effective against most candida species. They can also be used for serious mucosal infections due to candida, such as candida esophagitis. The canicandins do have activity against molds such as Aspergillus fumigatus. However, most clinicians do not regard them as first-line therapy for aspergillosis. It is very important to remember that the anchinocandins should not be used to treat cryptococcal infections or endemic fungal infections. Uh, these agents have no appreciable activity against Cryptococcus neoformans, and they are decidedly inferior agents to the azoles for histo, coxy, and blasto infections. The last class of antifungal agents that I want to discuss inhibits nucleic acid synthesis in fungi. So flucytosine is a fluorinated derivative of cytosine, one of the nucleoside bases required for DNA synthesis. As flucytosine is taken up in the cell and incorporated into nucleic acid, it results in termination of the growing DNA chain. This medication is somewhat fungal specific, but it can have inhibitory effects non-selectively on mammalian cells. Therefore, one of the main toxicities of flucytosine is inhibition of some of the most rapidly dividing cells in the body, especially hematopoietic cells. Therefore, cytopenias are often seen when this medication is used. Flucytosine has inhibitory effect on many candida species and Cryptococcus neoformans. However, it should never be used alone as therapy, since resistance to this medication rapidly develops. The medication is most commonly used in combination with amphotericin B, again during the induction phase of the treatment of meningitis due to Cryptococcus neoformans. Detailed comparative clinical studies in this otherwise lethal infection have definitively shown that the addition of flucytosine results in the more rapid clearance of cryptococcus from the cerebrospinal fluid and also in improved survival. So in conclusion, most of our focus has been to consider specific medications that target biochemical or physiological processes that differ between fungi and their infected mammalian host. And I've included a table summarizing many of the features of the major antifungals as well as side effects and indications for these medicines. However, in thinking about treating and preventing fungal infections, I encourage you to think a bit more creatively and broadly rather than what is currently available. For example, how can we maintain a healthy microbiome in ourselves and in our patients to prevent excessive fungal colonization at mucosal surfaces? Perhaps judicious use of antibacterial agents or even probiotic therapy may help prevent fungal infections in some patients, and this concept deserves further study. Investigators are studying fungal attachment to various human cells or the specific nutrients that they need for optimal growth. These type of basic studies may also lead to novel ways to prevent fungal invasion or to eradicate fungal growth in the host. Also, as we better understand the ways in which our immune system effectively responds to fungal challenges, we can perhaps augment these responses with vaccines or other immune-based therapies to better care for our patients without promoting further antimicrobial resistance.